again as Zach is going to bring to us our reading for this morning.
I'll maybe divide this two on each side, which, which, whichever way you want to divide yourselves. Okay, Holly and Cora and Henry and Lucy. Jack is not going to join in too, that's, that's fine. <laughs> fine <laughs> Just want to take a hold of that side, you take a hold of that side. Is, is there any other volunteers or some of the other? Zach. Zach, you want to join in? <laughs> Anyone else want to join in the other side just to even it up a wee bit? Jack, Jack's done it. Okay, so going to join in this way. <laughs> so we have, we have kind of a bit. Don't start pulling yet, folks. <laughs> so we have, we have the middle point about here, okay? So the other end of the rope is about... Uh, so here's one point, and where Jack is the other point. So we'll say... Actually, do you want to move down a wee bit? So there's room. <laughs> a wee bit more, okay? So here's the halfway point. So we'll say, if this halfway point gets as far as just beyond this queue, so if, the, if these ones pull up back, this team wins, but if it gets pulled back to as far as this pew here, they will say this side wins, okay? So we'll say, um, okay, are you ready? On the count of three, one, two, three. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And an adversary is basically an opponent. It is, it is an enemy. And Peter is saying our enemy, the one we struggle against, is, is the devil. Elsewhere in the Bible, uh, Paul writes in one of his letters that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil. In other words, what, what, what the Bible tells us is actually our biggest battle, our biggest struggle is not actually with one another, but is actually against the devil. That we have a real enemy and therefore we have a real struggle. Which is why for the first point um, I have borrowed a phrase from youth culture, which is basically, the struggle is real. The struggle is real. Because the devil is like a lion prowling around. Like a lion proudly red. I'm sure all of us will have seen some kind of nature documentaries, uh, uh, um, any of the David Attenborough programs, any of the, the wildlife programs. Yes, I see Henry's going up, hand going up. Some of us would have seen, I was going to try and do a David Attenborough action. <laughs> but I'll spare you. You know, where you, you kind of see kind of this lion stalking somewhere around um, the Serengeti or somewhere kind of, are, are kind of prowling around, stalking its prey, kind of lurking about, kind of hiding in the bushes. They get just closed off and then it leaps out and it pounces. It so that's generally the way that lions go. They're sneaky, they're devious, but they're also deadly. Um, in fact, here's some of the things that Jesus says about the devil. He says in John's Gospel that he was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So Jesus is saying that when the devil strikes, when he tries to get his teeth into people, what he does so uh, is through lies. Because his plan is to drive people away from the truth, away from God. The Bible also tells us that the devil 
is the accuser of our brothers who accuses them day and night before God. So I, I, another thing that the devil does, because someone who uh, is an accuser, basically they just say bad stuff about you all the time. And so the way the devil prowls is that he lies in wait, waiting to say bad stuff about God to us. But he also says bad stuff about us to God. He's an accuser. There's nothing good about him. Which is why Peter describes him of being like a liar. You know, the, the devil isn't some kind of pussycat that some of us might have at home. So it's like, I know you have a couple of cats. You know, the devil isn't like Itty Kitty that you might have at home or a funny dress with some cats. He's not some kind of harmless little kind of um, small thing. But he is, you know, he's like a liar. He is dangerous and he's deadly, which is why he's our enemy. So the question might be that, well, if the devil is like a lion who's seeking basically to devour us, how do you fight off a lion? Because I don't know about you, but I've never actually fought a lion, but I can't imagine I'd come out on the winning end, e- e- even if it was. Um, but has anyone here ever been to the circus? Can I see a show of hands here ever been to the circus? A couple of hands going up. Um, I- I- I'll admit it's been a while since I've been to the circus, but the last time I was there, um, there was a lion tamer. And one of the things that the lion tamer had was a whip. And the lion tamer seemed to use the whip, not actually on the lion, but it would, every so often he would kind of smack the ground uh, uh, as a way of saying, uh, as telling the lion, well, the lion can't go here, but he'd also use the whip to kind of direct the lion where it could go. So the lion tamer was able to stop the lion from going places and actually direct the lion where it could go. Um, I'm not Indiana Jones with the whip, so I can't be as. <laughs> So, so you're all safe enough. Um, but the good news, and what the Bible tells us, is actually Jesus is our lion table. Jesus is our lion table. Because we should think of the devil as a defeated enemy. Or almost like a, a, a tamed lion. That because of Jesus, that the devil can roar like a lion, but he's very much a whipped lion. Because he can't get you. The devil can't actually get us, and that's because of what Jesus does on the cross. For Jesus defeated on the cross the power of the devil. For the devil's power to deceive and to lie and to destroy and to kill has been whipped and has been driven back by the resurrection of Jesus. See, it is in the person of Jesus, in the work of Jesus, that the devil is whipped. The devil is a whipped enemy. Which is why Peter tells us in this reading that we can resist him firm in your faith. We can resist the devil firm in our faith. Because when we believe in Jesus, we actually become part of a resistance movement. We have a power that we didn't have before. We have a power that we didn't have that can resist him. Uh, I I was sharing in the prayer meeting before this. One of the things that's funny is that the Bible tells us that we should always run from temptation, but never actually tells us to run from the tempter. In fact, the Bible tells us that if we resist the devil, that that, that he's actually the one that flees from us. That if we stand firm, if we resist the devil, then he's actually the one that runs away with his tail between his legs. Um, My parents back home in Cavan, they have two dogs. Um, okay, if you want to put up the, the, the next slide. Um, so there's two dogs. One is a golden retriever, but does anyone know the, the breed of that dog? Boxer. A boxer, yes, a boxer. So it's lots of energy, but not, but, but not much brains. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I was a hard but that generally describes them. Um, so uh, the dog's name is Coco, but any time you go home to my, to my mum and dad's, um, Coco will always stand there and she'll bark and she'll bark and she'll bark. And she's bark. But I mean, as soon as you go to even take a step towards her, she, she's off like a shot. She's running away. <laughs> so her bark sounds scary, but you, if you actually stand firm, she actually has to be more scared of, of you. That is the same with the devil. <coughs> that he can roar at us all he wants. But we can resist him. We can send him packing. Because of Jesus. We can send the devil packing with his tail between his legs because of Jesus. And that's because by faith in Jesus, the strength of Jesus, the power of Jesus actually becomes ours. Whereas through the Holy Spirit, Jesus lives inside us. 
So we actually have the lion tamer within us. By faith we have the lion tamer within us. So we can resist the devil by telling him to go exactly where he belongs, which is in hell. And the thing is that the devil would so dearly love to bring as many of us with them to hell as he can. But because of Jesus, we can stand firm and we can resist. We can stand firm. We can resist because of Jesus. Which is why there's no safer place to be than in God's hands. No safer place to be than in God's hands. Peter uh, says in these verses, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. The God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. You see, like in the game tug of war, the only way you were able to pull uh, the, the, the enemy or, or the opposing side was if you had more strength to be able uh, to pull them. You, you also needed a tight grip of the rope to be able to pull them. If it was anyway slack or was a weak grip, it would just it would just slip out of your hands. But what Peter is telling us here is that our God has a mighty hand, and so he has a mighty grip of us. And his mighty grip never slips, it never lessens, and it never lets go. So the devil has no chance to snatch you from God's hands. But does God have you this morning? And do you have him? Because through faith in Jesus, you can be kept safe in the Lord's hands under his mighty protection. And if you've never given your life to Jesus, then what better day to do so than today? Because Peter tells us that, that those who are in God's hands will be restored, they'll be strengthened, they'll be confirmed, and they'll be established. And so Peter is saying is that to be restored means that we'll be healed from our hearts. To be confirmed means that we won't just topple over, that we won't fall flat on our faces. To be strengthened means that we won't collapse, that we won't fall apart. And to be established means that we will have a security. We will have a permanence about our security. That nothing will ever change about that. Now, I don't know about you, but normally um, when I grip something, or have a mighty grip of something, it usually means I'm squeezing the life out of it. Um, um, or usually that, that, that applies when holding the TV remote at least. <laughs> you know, if you have a tight grip of it. But, but when the Lord has a tight grip of us, it's actually the opposite. He doesn't squeeze the life out of us, but actually gives life to us. Because notice the words Peter uses, that, that the God's mighty hands, that they're also healing hands. God's mighty hands are caring hands. They are steadying hands. They are securing hands. And so there are no better hands to be in than in the hands of our God. Because there is an enemy who prowls around like a lion. But God has given us a lion to him. Who allowed himself to be devoured for us on the cross. So that by his resurrection the devil could be silenced. And as a result we could be held safe in God's hands. Where the devil can't do a thing about. Because our God is powerful. And he is powerful to save. And he can save you if you come to him. And if you come and ask him. He's powerful to save us from every enemy, every situation, every foe. Let's pray. Lord, we know that we have a real enemy who is also a real king who would love to do nothing more than to devour us. And so Lord, we thank you today that we have the power, <coughs> Lord, in you, because you can close the mouth of every lion and of every enemy. Lord, we thank you that you can save us from all danger, and Lord, you can save us even from death. 
And so we say sorry for all of the things that we've done wrong. And we place our trust in your son. In Jesus. And Lord we ask that we would know. We would experience. Your mighty hands of healing. Of care. Of, of steadying and of securing. Because we know there is no safer place to be. Than to be with you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.